uh, I would like to uh, give the floor uh, to uh, Fausto Poca. Professor Poca, uh, you you have the floor. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michel, and uh, good evening to everybody. Um, as I have to start this um, uh, interesting meeting, uh, let me give some uh, um, elements uh, on the legislation, the existing legislation, which is uh, uh, important. Uh, let me start uh, from the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, because this is the, the I would say, the, uh, the instrument uh, that would be more at hand today to deal with this uh, crime uh, of uh, modern slavery. Uh, and when we speak of modern slavery, we have to take into account uh, that slavery is uh, perhaps, uh, if not the oldest, one of the oldest crimes against humanity. Uh, largely before the concept itself of crimes against humanity existed, because uh, it's enough to go back in the history and uh, slavery exists as, as of always. So uh, in practice, uh, from the beginning of our, uh, of our history, even the great civilization in the past had slavery. Uh, were based to a large extent on slavery. So um, it's, it's an old crime and it's a bit uh, strange that today uh, it's still a sort of neglected crime uh, to a certain extent. Although legislation is not uh, uh, so, uh, so remained so much uh, um, in the back. I would say, because uh, if you look uh, at the statute of the International Criminal Court, uh, you have slavery as a crime against humanity in one of the first provisions of Article 7 on the statute. And then you have an explicit reference when, uh, uh, the, when uh, the enslavement is dealt with, with the notion of enslavement is dealt with in the statute, in the same article, an explanation of what slavery means, enslaved means. And uh, the, the statute clearly says that, that uh, uh, the enslavement means the exercise of any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership over a person. So it's uh, what uh, is uh, the, the basic of slavery is that one person is in the power of another person and completely in the power of that other person. And, um, and uh, the statute continues to say that this includes the exercise um, of uh, the power, such power, in the course of trafficking in person, in particular women and children which are more vulnerable than, than men, but slavery is also affecting men. Uh, maybe in particular, you may deal with uh, women and children as more vulnerable part of the population, but men are also slaves in uh, the same way. In particular, uh, within uh, the uh, migration phenomenon, migration is uh, free, there, is, uh, there are more possibilities moving today than there were in the past, probably. But that does not mean that uh, this freedom of movement is really a freedom also of uh, uh, rights. In, uh, in when, uh, because one of the basic practices of uh, enslavement of individuals when they migrate for labor reasons, essentially, is that uh, the trafficker uh, wants, um, makes an arrangement with the person who wants to go abroad, who pays an amount to be transferred abroad with the promise of having a job 
essentially. When he arrives, he may get the job, but the job will be poorly paid and uh, the money one receives is, has to be used to repay the trafficker that uh, uh, was not paid entirely. He gets 50% of what he deserves. But the problem is that the salary is never sufficient to pay the full debt because there are the interests that come up. So this person is, in fact, a slave. He's a slave that has to uh, remain slave all his life, apparently, although sometimes, of course, he succeeds or she succeeds in escaping. Women are forced to prostitution. Children are forced to labor and prostitution as well. And what is even worse, especially for children, they are transferred sometimes uh, and frequently, uh, mainly for trafficking in their organs. So they are killed, essentially, taken away organs in order to uh, um, uh, serve surgery on other people. And this is, again, is money that goes to the, uh, to the traffickers. So why very little is made? The legislation is, uh, is there. The Rome statute is there. The, uh, and not, not only. Before that, we have, uh, we had as of 2000, the, uh, the, the protocol to the convention, uh, the Palermo convention on, uh, uh, specifically this protocol is on trafficking. And uh, that protocol gives a very interesting definition of the trafficking, which is quite wide, quite large, and includes many of the, uh, the, the features of modern slavery. It describes them quite, quite well, uh, covering a lot of situations. At the point that if we look at what is covered by the convention, the protocol to the convention of Palermo on trafficking in person, there will be not only the provision on slavery that will come into consideration in the Rome Statute. You will have the uh, forcible transfer, the deportation, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution. There are a number of provisions that could come into consideration. So a case of modern slavery would not come only under the provision, specific provision of slavery, so it would be covered by other provision of the statute as well, not to uh, just including at the end the inhuman treatment simply, which uh, other inhuman treatment, which is again a crimes against humanity. So there are a number of situations that are covered. And so why nothing or little happens? Um, there may be various, various reasons, but the cases are very limited. Uh, Professor Vote has just uh, mentioned in his introduction the limited percent or zero per zero zero something percent of cases that are prosecuted and punished. So uh, it's clearly a, 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 a type of crime that is not very popular, although it is. Um, very widespread and uh, very much, uh, very much uh, frequent. Um, in my experience as the, uh, in the ICTY, in former Yugoslavia, um, we had to deal in one case of uh, trafficking, but not really of trafficking because uh, we had evidence on trafficking, but the fact is that the case was a case of rape the prosecutor had judged essentially rape, and uh, we just could reach uh, enslavement, sexual enslavement, under that uh, umbrella, but not uh, the trafficking that the persons, after being raped, were trafficking among soldiers in in war, and that was a, a, a clear a clear case of trafficking in war because the soldiers sold the women 
and children that they, uh, in many cases, were children because they're minors, women, but minors at the same time. So under the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, they were children also. And um, these were transferred to other soldiers for amounts which appear ridiculous in a way, because at the time in the former Yugoslavia, the money, the uh, currency was, uh, the hard currency was the Deutsche Mark. And uh, one of these women could be sold for an amount of between 300 and 500 marks, which is a, a small amount for in hard currency, clearly. But uh, uh, in war may be more important, but still is not an amount of the, which, uh, uh, which should be. So in that case, uh, we nevertheless succeeded in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, defining enslavement under customary international law. So adding one um, piece, one part of law that deals with this matter. So not only conventions, but also customary international law. And we uh, clarified, the tribunal clarified, that enslavement may occur even when the victims still enjoy the jure, a certain freedom of movement, but the situation in which they find themselves leave them no real choice of escape with the prospect of conducting an independent life. So it's uh, we also the psychological side of enslavement was taken uh, was taken into account. But that was the only case that I saw in international criminal jurisdictions. I never saw another case of this kind. So it's, it's really uh, too limited. The, uh, and I frankly don't understand why the um, International Criminal Court, uh, in its now 20 years of life after the entry into force of the Roman Statute, never brought a case of this kind. Because we are speaking of a case that may be useful for millions of people, having definitions, having a, a court that takes care really of this, is more important probably than, uh, uh, than uh, convicting or, or trying to convict a head of state that uh, at the end will not, uh, nobody of poor people Nobody of common people will benefit much of that. Uh, so this will be uh, cases in which one may have even support from states that are not able to uh, deal uh, in a sufficient way with organized crime. And we should not forget that uh, under the Rome Statute, crimes against humanity means uh, uh, not only uh, crimes that, that uh, are committed uh, uh, against the population systematically or in a widespread manner, as in customer international law, but uh, that the, the, the status is more precise, as they say that the attack against the population has to be pursuant to or in furtherance of a state or organizational policy to commit the attack. Now, when you speak of organizations, it's clear we are dealing with organized crime, essentially, because this is what happens. It's not states that organize this. This is clearly organized crime that does. So uh, it would be, it's, it's a part of a fight against organized crime, but uh, it's, I have the impression that an international court is not dealing with these matters because normally organized crime is not dealt with by international courts. Even in the, the Balkans at the time, the court of Sarajevo, the domestic court of Sarajevo, dealt with international crimes that the ICTY referred to them but essentially was dealing with organized crime. So it's more left to states to, uh, to provide remedy in those situations. 
why states do it so little? Did they introduce correctly the Rome Statute into their domestic legislation? This should be something that we should assess. I didn't make a full uh, uh, consideration of this. There are I saw some states that introduced it correctly, but did all of them introduce it correctly? And I say that because my own country that ratified this Rome Statute among the first ones did not introduce the domestic legislation introducing the crimes the international crimes into the domestic legislation until now. It's only now that recently the Minister of Justice appointed a committee to draft this domestic legislation, uh, adapting the domestic legislation to the international legislation. It's true, we had in our law slavery as a crime, of course, but it's different if one does it as an international crime. It's more the, the international dimension is important. And uh, I was uh, uh, chosen to preside over that committee. And now there is a draft law that will be probably adopted in, in a short time. And all these questions are dealt with in that, in that law. But I don't know if all states did uh, such an exercise. Uh, maybe uh, there is a reason that uh, uh, the, uh, the problem is that, in my view, that uh, the perpetrators of this crime are not high-level personalities. And uh, there is a trend in international life to give more weight to prosecuting persons of high level. Of a, of a certain uh, high level. Even the case in the ICTY we had, the persons were not persons of high level in the, in the combat. They were a group that was uh, of lower level. And uh, there is a trend to go only towards the, the high level. They may, the same um, uh, statute, Rome statute, says it, that one should uh, uh, prosecute basically more the leaders, the high level people. So uh, when you are at an organized crime, you frequently don't have high level people. They may be high level in terms of criminality, but not in terms of level in the society. They certainly are not. Uh, so there may be a difficulty of this. I don't think it's a problem of difficult investigation because uh, uh, it should be relatively easy to investigate uh, these, uh, these cases. And I don't even think there are obstacles by states in doing that, because many states will be happy to uh, get rid of this problem at the end, instead of having, uh, uh, having uh, everyday cases of, of this kind. So, uh, we have a legislation, an international legislation. Um, I don't know if there are really gaps in the legislation because uh, international norms cover the situation, but there is uh, uh, less uh, inclination to deal with these crimes. Uh, probably because uh, the idea is these are not uh, of the level that uh, should be uh, dealt with. My, my personal view is that uh, uh, the level of the perpetrator may be important in certain cases, but if the crime is really egregious, it's important to deal with the crime and to create presence in the crime because to describe the phenomenon is different if people speak of uh, uh, migrants that are enslaved. Uh, normally, population do not like uh, too many migrants, uh, so it's, it passes by. But if there are decisions, judicial decisions, that describe the phenomenon in human rights terms and, uh, um, and give examples, it would be different, probably. So uh, I really would hope that the ICC will uh, 
start uh, dealing with this problem, which is extremely important in my view. Well, I stop here. I don't want to take all the time from my colleagues. They probably have, certainly have uh, <laughs> issues more interesting to say that what I said, because I'm not a specialist of this type of uh, conduct. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fausto. It's very interesting, and, uh, and especially with your experience of uh, ICTY and also the experience of uh, uh, ICC and, and uh, with uh, Italian legislation. And uh, I, I would love to, to, to hear also uh, 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 Professor Pocard. Yeah, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you have, a, first of all, you have a, a comments about uh, what uh, both uh, uh, Kevin uh, Highland and, uh, and Anna Berner said. What uh, you say? Well, uh, I listened with, uh, with great interest to, to um, both uh, speakers, uh, uh, to, to what they said, to Alain and Kevin. And uh, um, I can only agree with them, actually, what, what they said. I have nothing to say against. Um, especially, I find, uh, I find uh, both, uh, both interventions very powerful. Um, and uh, uh, I will reflect myself on the list of uh, uh, devoirs that uh, we should follow. To, uh, but in essence, I believe uh, it's like for other issues that uh, uh, we, we try to do an exploitation of children or what I mean, w that has gone to some extent and to stop uh, uh, making money out of what is illegal, illegal uh, and unacceptable unacceptable morally so uh, that that's the real point at the end because this is a big business uh, as always it was always like that because uh, there is some uh, misunderstanding in speaking in modern slavery it's modern slavery is not very different from old slavery because at the end it was just exploitation of people for work and getting advantages I mean, when one builds the pyramids with slaves, uh, well, that's the his work, exploiting work, and uh, and of course uh, even the lives because in such kind of world people die also. So there are a, a number of uh, uh, features that put the two slaveries, what we call modern, is the oldest contracting people buying, buying people actually because paying and uh, paying those who exploit. So that means uh, what did the, the traffic of slaves, uh, the transatlantic uh, traffic of slaves? There were there too, there were mediators that were mm, uh, cat capturing the people in Africa and then mm, uh, making money, transferring there, making money out of it. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not much different. It's simply the, the techniques Maybe slightly different today because we have a modern, uh, modern technology actually to, to, to do the same. But the essence is, is still, is still the old one. And, um, uh, one should find a way of, uh, uh, saying that uh, it is illegal, but also implement that, that it's legal making money out of certain uh, activities. I mean, and so where it's done by small perpetrators, high level perpetrators, multinationals or whatever, it does matter. But uh, I think it's, a, it's what has to be done actually. So follow the money and probably is the best way to, to arrive at, at the substance of the case. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Fausto. Uh, actually, I, I see four questions. I don't know whether, uh, possibly I will read them briefly. And uh, <coughs> whoever, Kevin or, or you, Fausto, if you want to answer them, uh, please feel free because uh, uh, <coughs> normally we have uh, 20 more minutes. And uh, 
So first question is uh, workers uh, in uh, the condition of slavery in agriculture and uh, mentioning especially in Italy, so workers in agriculture. And, and then I would just say that uh, actually there was a, a report before the Human Rights Council precisely on this category of, uh, of victims, uh, and that was discussed last week in Geneva. Second question, porn companies, pornography companies are protected and uh, are better protected than children. Uh, that's the second question. The third is about uh, the purchase of human organs for medical reasons. Is there any ethical restriction uh, uh, to safeguard the purchase of human organs? Of course, uh, Kevin, you could speak also about uh, this uh, uh, Council of Europe Convention against uh, human trafficking. And then the fourth question is uh, from Professor Elman Mad, a friend from Morocco. Uh, thank you, uh, Khalifa, for being with us. Uh, the gap between the law and its implementation is due to the ignorance of this law by many law practitioners. Uh, they are <laughs> actually trained in private law, but not so much uh, in uh, anything dealing with uh, human trafficking. <laughs> ignorance of the law, I must say, uh, as you know, <laughs> as president. Uh, honorary president of the San Remo Institute, uh, we are very much into training, training military people, but possibly we should uh, possibly training uh, judges. We should be uh, training, uh, <coughs> and we did train border guards about uh, refugee law, uh, but what about uh, human trafficking? You see, the problem is also, um, in my view, at least, the problem is what uh, came out of the last intervention of Kevin, actually, uh, that you have to intervene also on uh, situations in which persons may be favorable to trafficking their members of the family because they have no other option sometimes. And so, Selling a, one of the children for organs or other um, pornography, whatever, I mean, and saving the rest of the family is the only option that remains to some people. So you have to take into account also this situation, which goes also to the information about the law, of course, information of rights. But uh, it has to be done properly, because uh, sometimes uh, I saw one of the questions, it's easy to speak of uh, equality, one of the interventions speak of equality, but you must create a real equality, because otherwise uh, there are desperate people. I mean, I saw these migrants here in the Mediterranean. Sometimes you have parents that put on the boat the child, and they die. And they die, these parents, hoping that the child will arrive somewhere and have a future. So uh, families that are in this situation and um, in these conditions may make sacrifices, either selling a person of the family in order to save the rest, but these are interventions have to be made also in that respect. I think it's not just a question of informing the people. One has to create a situation where we're not obliged to make certain choices. Yes, uh, also, but anything about the training, uh, you know. Well, um, well, training, of course, is important. The more people, yeah. uh, lawyers in particular, trained on these matters you have, the more you may have people that work on this topic, actually, which is, uh, which is important. And uh, I'm a, a bit uh, surprised, I said in my first intervention, that at high levels, like uh, international judges, prosecutors should be, they pay no attention to this. It's uh, 
is ignorance? I don't think so, because this they must know the law. I am not sure they don't know the law. But uh, uh, an effort has to be made also in that respect, of course.